I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not Pastor Jason. I know, get it out now, just tell me, okay? But I'm Pastor Brennan Lamar. I'm a pastor here at Discovery. I've had the privilege of walking with Pastor Jason since the beginning of Discovery. My running joke, and I say it every time because I'm not over it yet, is when I first met him, he was like, you know, tell me about what Discovery would be. And then later he told me, you were my first member. And I said, I would not have come if I'd have known I was your first member at Discovery. <laughs> No, but I'm kidding. I love it here. I love being able to worship here with you guys every week. Isn't worship powerful? Isn't God powerful what he's doing here? I love worshiping with you. I love praying with you. I love walking with people and watching my friends get married here at Discovery and then have little Discovery babies. I call them Discovery babies. And I also love walking with people through trial, walking with people through the pain of loss, praying with people who are believing for a miracle. And I love that because that's the church. That's what God called us to be, amen? That's who we're supposed to be today. I'm so fired up and excited to share with you. I hope you can hang with me today as we kind of navigate into a topic that's a little bit difficult, but I'm not gonna give it away yet. I don't know what that was. That's my beard. I'm not gonna give it away yet. It's a little difficult, but I'm excited to share it with you. And I love what God has done. As I was getting ready to come up here, I saw a picture from seven years ago. And it was one of our very first worship experiences at Discovery. And I thank God because we didn't have an AC then. And it was summertime. God was moving, but the Lord moves more when it's 74 degrees. Some of you say amen. How many of you love Jesus today? Come on, let them know if you love Jesus. That's right. How many of your friends would say that you love Jesus? Okay. How many of your coworkers would say that you love Jesus? Some of y'all are just clapping because you know what's about to hit you. You know, Jesus had something to say about this. I'm not, listen, I'm, I'm on your side, okay? Trust me. But Jesus had something to say about this. Would you check this verse out with me? Jesus said in one of his very first public appearances, speaking to people, it's the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, you know it. This is what Jesus said. You, that's you guys, all right? All y'all who cheered, okay, everyone who didn't cheer, they're like, thank God that I did not cheer. You guys are the salt of the earth, but... What good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Think about this. I like kosher salt and sometimes Himalayan because I, I like watched a TV ad commercial one time that said it was good for me. But how many of you, if you had salt and it wasn't salty, you would keep it? You'd be like, get that crap out of here, right? Like when I get a steak, I'm like salt bay over that thing. <laughs> And, and I want that salt to roll off. I want it to add flavor. So, but Jesus goes on. He says, can you make it salty again if it loses its flavor? No, you just get rid of it. And then he says, it would be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. And then he says this. He says, you are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Church, my fear is that what Jesus was warning us about 2,000 years ago is still the concern today. As a matter of fact, Barna Research concluded a study and they found that nine out of 10 Christians struggle to share their faith. Nine out of 10. That means some of y'all were lying when you were clapping. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I get it. It's hard to share our faith. And, and as we look at this verse, Jesus is kind of doing this juxtaposition. He's saying, He's kind of saying things that, that are a little ridiculous because PG&E rates are too high for me to turn my light on and then throw a blanket over it. You don't do that. He's saying, listen, you, you wouldn't get salt and, and then it not be salty and you keep it. You, you wouldn't get a light and turn it on and then cover it. You just wouldn't do that. And he's saying, but listen, that's what we do. He says this, he says, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see why so that the world will praise your heavenly Father. God's calling us to make a difference. And throughout Jesus' ministry, we see him going and seeking out the lost. You know, you remember parables like, like the, the shepherd who left 99 just to find one. Jesus' mission was that he would seek out the lost and bring them to him. And that's our mission. And I can prove it because one of the last things Jesus said before he was resurrected into heaven was this. He said, 
He, he came to his disciples. He said, I've been given all authority in heaven. I've got it all and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And this is the promise for us. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This was so important to Jesus because literally when he was resurrected, he trusted that 12 men would take the gospel and share it with the world. If you're sitting here today and you love Jesus, it's because 12 guys went out and shared their faith. Today, God is calling us to be salt and to be light. God is calling us to share. And, and I want to just bring a truth to you today that I want to hold on to. And I hope you can gather today. And that truth is this. We were created to share. And that's your first point. You could write that down. And I hope as you write that down, you begin to believe it. Did you know that when God created you, he created you to make a difference? Did you know that when God made you and formed you, when you experienced his grace, that his plan was never for his grace to stop at you? You see, you're salt. God's calling us to be salt and light. But what does salt do? Salt, salt actually makes things better. Salt makes things better. Salt makes you thirsty. What Jesus is saying here is when people get around you, they should get thirsty for the gospel. They should get thirsty for God. They should get around you and go, I want what you have. And likewise, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, I'm not a great light. Okay, well, that makes a few of us, okay? Not me all the time either, especially the person I cut off on the way here. And it just so happened that I pulled into the parking lot and they pulled in too. So whoever you are, I'm just kidding, that didn't happen. But what does light do? Light makes people aware. Jesus is saying, listen, everywhere you go, you're going to make people thirsty, hungry for God. Everywhere you go, your light's going to bring awareness to people. Light casts out darkness. You're going to bring awareness. And this message that we have to share is the hope of the world. You were created to share. You were created to shine. You were created to add flavor to a world that was desperate and hungry for the truth. That's why God created you. And this message that we have, that we hold on to, it's the hope of the world. You have the hope of the world, and it's living inside of you. Some of you have been forgiven. Come on, say amen if you've been forgiven today. You've got forgiveness. The gospel, it's good news, y'all. We can share it. But most of the time, we're afraid of sharing it. And did you know that gospel literally translates to good news? But if the gospel is good news, why is it so difficult to share it? Why is it so hard to share with your friends at work. I love this story. Paul sheds some light on why it's so difficult for us to share. There's this really small book in the Bible and it's called Philemon. And I love Philemon. Philemon was a very successful businessman who actually had gotten saved and he had a little house church at home. And, and so it's kind of like a discovery group. Somebody say amen, come on. So he was like having this little discovery group at home and he actually knew Paul and he had supported Paul on Paul's missionary journey. And, and you know, Philemon had a slave and this slave, the Bible said, ran away from Paul. I would run away too if I was a slave. So you can kind of gather. I wonder why a slave would run away. Maybe he was being mistreated, who knows? But we, we don't know that. All we know is that he had a slave who ran away. And the Bible says that that slave found Paul in Rome. Small world, right? And he finds Paul and he gets saved. Paul, Paul gets him saved. And he, he's so impacted by the kingdom of God. He's so impacted by the gospel that he says, listen, I, I feel like I have to go back to my master, the one I ran away from. And so Paul says, well, if you're going to go back, let me write you a letter so he doesn't kill you because he has every right to kill you. And, and that's what we know about Philemon, but I like to read into it a little bit, and I like to kind of add a little bit of flavor. Let's add some salt today, huh? So let's just really think about this. This slave comes to Paul, 
And, you know, Paul goes, hey, you know, I I hated Christians too at one point. Matter of fact, I killed a lot of them. And this guy's like, I like you, you know. And he goes, but God changed my life. And now I'm experiencing freedom. And so, you know, he has this radical encounter with Paul, and and he gets saved. And and Paul starts, you know, I'm guessing just like most of us, he'd be like, hey, so where are you from? And he goes, oh, I I used to hang out, and I worked for Philemon. And he goes, I I know Philemon. This is crazy. And he goes, you know Philemon? He's got the house church. He's like, yeah, he's got the house church. He goes, "But, but wait, wait, you were with Philemon, and he never shared with you the gospel? You, you were with Philemon, and he never told you about the good news that you could have in Christ? And so Paul writes this to him, and he says this, you know, as he's talking to him in, in Philemon 1, 4 through 6, he says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. This is Paul talking to Philemon. He said, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. How many of you want a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ today? I'm after a full understanding. And I believe it's from this perspective that I've shared with you that we can see Paul showing us some incredible things, some barriers, might I say, to sharing our faith, to being salt, to being light. And the first barrier to sharing that that we see in this scripture is an inward focus. Let's let's look at this again, this scripture again. Write it down quick, all right, because I'm ready to move. I told you to buckle up, all right, inward focus. Let's go to the verse. Let's see it. Okay, yeah, finally, and there we go. He said, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Philemon, you do really well with Christians, You love Christians, but a barrier that we can sometimes have is that we develop an inward focus and not an outward focus. Paul's saying, you love the saints, you love Christians well, but don't forget to share your faith, especially with those you're with every day. And maybe Paul knew the danger of an inward-looking, self-centered version of Christianity where instead of, of loving others who are far from God, we begin to judge others who are far from God. Instead of receiving others who are far from God, we begin to press away others who are far from God. You see, I believe today that, that in even myself sometimes, I'm preaching to myself that I can surround myself with people who are like me and forget that God has called me to share and created me to share and created me to be salt and light. Our attitude can become, stay away from the world. Oh, they watch R-rated movies. We can't go over there. Oh my gosh, I would never be caught dead around him. He smokes pot. Oh, I don't want to be around him. He does this. Some of y'all looked up right now. You're like, pot? Yeah, okay, I said it. All right. (laughs) Anyways, okay. And Paul's saying, listen, this inward focus is dangerous because God's called us to share. We don't run from darkness, church. We shine into darkness. That's what God's called us to do. But what we're doing is we're putting a blanket over the light. You know, it's the title of my message today. It's it's Hidden Lights. Because I think we've grown all too accustomed to having our light hidden. And I believe that the third, the second barrier, rather, to sharing our faith is is similar. It's that we've lost our passion. We've lost our passion to share. Uh, We've maybe forgot about what God has done in our life, because if you truly know and remember what God has done in your life, you'd share it. If you truly live in the reality of, of who you would be without Christ, you would share it. We've, we've lost our passion to share. We've lost our passion to share our faith. And I think that it's really easy because we get busy and life happens. I have two kids. Lord, nobody told me this was gonna happen, y'all. Okay, this stuff's crazy. We also, you know, when it comes to sharing our faith, we don't want to be the weird person, right? Amen. How many of you know some weird people? You're like, you're weird. I don't want to be like that person who's sharing. And we might even feel like we just don't know enough. I think that's most of us. We're like, well, uh, you know, is there a pastor around to talk to this guy? Because I don't know enough, you know? So why, why doesn't someone else share with him? We think if we understood more about the Bible and faith, if I went to church more, then I'd share my faith. But Paul's saying the opposite. 
to Philemon. Look at this verse again. Paul's saying, Philemon, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. Why? So that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Church, it's the opposite of what you think. Your full understanding in Christ isn't unlocked until you begin to share. The very thing that's keeping us from sharing is, I don't know enough. And, and what Paul's saying is, no, 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 that's okay. You share, and then you will know more. Because when you go to someone and, and you just share, you say, man, God healed me from a terrible past, and, and my trajectory was horrible, yet I, I just encountered and received his grace. And, and man, I can't, I can't even begin to tell you the weight that was lifted off my shoulders when I surrendered the situation to Christ. When you share that, it reminds you. You remember what God has done. It gives you a fuller understanding. You see, it's when I begin to share my faith that my passion increases. Passion follows sharing. We share first and then our passion increases. But a lot of us, we've lost our passion to share. And there are some of you, some of you today, there was a time in your life when you were really passionate about Jesus. And now, you're not. And if you were honest, you would you would admit that your passion has faded. And I can guarantee you that from the time you were passionate till this moment, right now, right here today, the one thing that changes you stop sharing is that you stop sharing your faith, is that you stop sharing what God had done for you, and your passion begin to dwindle. Because when I share, my passion increases. So if you've lost passion today, and I, and I resonate with you. Listen, I, I'm not the guy who's just preaching this at you. I'm the guy who struggles with you. If I've lost my passion, then I need to begin to share of what God has done for me. I need to just be salt and light because I was created to share. You were created to share. Do you believe that today, church? The third barrier to sharing is the fear of rejection. I think this is the biggest. You know, did you know the fear of rejection is actually the deepest human fear that psychologists say we have. It, we're biologically wired with a longing to belong. And we can begin to believe that sharing might cause us to be seen in a critical way. It, it, we're anxious about the prospect of being cut off, maybe from a family member, a loved one, a coworker, a friend, demeaned or isolated. Uh, trust me, I understand this fear of rejection. I'll never forget. Six years ago, I was flying my brother to Texas we had just started Discovery Church. I was working a full-time job and, and also working at the church. Some of y'all know what that's like, you know? You're, you're really, you know, not making any money at all and just loving Jesus every day, you know? And so I'm here in this terminal flying my brother to Texas, and I watched this guy walk in. Instantly, he caught my attention in the weirdest way ever. And I was like, oh, this, is, this guy's crazy. It doesn't help that he literally looked like Lenny Kravitz and he had like a Prada bag. I was like, this guy's literally, he's legit, dude, you know? And so like, I just couldn't shake this guy and I'm watching him and and, you know, they, they start boarding the plane, and he's one of the first ones to board the plane. I'm one of the last ones because I'm cheap and I don't pay extra. And so I'm literally like the last one on the plane, and I'm walking, and I look to the back of the plane where my seat is. I told you I was cheap. And I, and I see this guy sitting there with a the seat, and I'm like, no, oh, that would be crazy if I sat next to him. And, you know, you're like, you're walking, you're looking up, you're looking up, you're looking up. And I look right in front of me, and there he is sitting in front of me. And there's a seat, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm sitting next to this guy. And he begins to talk to me, he begins to share with me, tell me about his life. And I could tell that he doesn't know the Lord, and, and he's just opening up. And I'm, you know, I really don't like talking to people on a plane because then when I'm like, I'm a pastor, they're like, oh, okay. And they put their, like, headphones on, and they start reading a book, you know. And so he, he gets around to ask me, well, what do you do? And, and I told him about the full-time job I had, but I left out the fact that I worked at a church because I was afraid. Because everything he had told me about his life, I, I, I was so certain that he would reject me that he would be opposed to the gospel. And the next day, I'm, I woke up in the morning and I'm reading through my devotional. And what verse do I, do I pop up on? Matthew 5, you're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. But what good is it if you, if you cover the light that you have? Instead, let your good deeds shine out for all the world to see that they might glorify your Father in heaven. And, and instantly I broke and I felt bad. I'll never forget this guy's name. He was Aldrich. I'll also never forget that he looked like Lenny Kravitz. Seriously. <laughs> He shared with me, he gave me all this cologne. He went around, he traveled around the world opening up stores. Tom Ford cologne, it's really nice. Anyways, I, I think of this guy and, and I was so afraid to share 
I was afraid that he would judge me, look down on me. I assumed he would be opposed in opposition to Christianity, to God. I assumed that because he was broken, he was lost, in need of a savior. But I know the truth today, and the truth today is that that's actually the very moment when he was most open for the gospel. It's a moment of brokenness where I'm saying, God, come find me, Lord, when I'm searching. It's a moment of brokenness when salt tastes good. It's a moment of brokenness where I begin to get thirsty for something more than the life I have. And here I am. And, and here God placed me here in this divine moment, and I missed it. Nine out of ten of us miss it. And, and I get it, I understand, and, and I'm here, and, and I, I resonate, and I look at this verse when I think about the lost in Luke 5. It, it says this, it says, Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Why are we so afraid of sharing to sick people? You know, the other day I went to pray for someone who had cancer, and he was down. The doctor said the day before, they said, listen, if he stops breathing, just don't resuscitate him. And he's praying, believing for a miracle, you know, it's the sick who need a doctor, not the healthy. And so in these moments when you're around someone who's hungry, when you're around someone who's thirsty, are you going to share or are you going to be afraid of rejection? Are you going to share or are you going to lean on the fact that I just don't know enough? Church, let's share. Maybe your barrier of rejection is worrying about how to share your faith with a coworker. Maybe, maybe you have a great relationship and you're just afraid. Maybe you own a business and, and you're afraid that, that if you were to, to truly be salt and light that it might change the way your employees look at you. But I'm telling you, God's got this figured out and he's created you to share today. So if, if, if we were really created to share, and I hope I've made a great point, okay, because Jesus was pretty clear on this. But if we were created to share, how do we do it? Uh, how do we get better at sharing? Because we'll all admit it's difficult. And I know what you're thinking. I'm not equipped. I don't know enough. But what do I have to share? Today, listen, I don't want to teach you how to, how to share today. Today, I want to show you that God has already given you everything you need to be salt and light. You don't need to know anything else. You don't need to study a book. You don't need to do any of that. God has given you and provided you everything you need to be salt and light. Isn't that a good news today? All right. So what do I have to share? What do you have to share? I believe God's already given you something to share. If you're here right now within the sound of my voice, this is simple. You have a church. You have a church to share. I used to go to a church when I got saved I, had, I lived a, a tough life before I found the Lord, and I was surrounded with all the wrong people. And when I got saved, I began to tell my friends about Jesus. The problem was my friends were far from the Lord, and I was at a church where I was afraid of inviting them. I was afraid they would be judged. They all had tattoos, and they smelled like alcohol from the night before. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Those were my friends, and I wanted them to hear the gospel. But I'm telling you here at Discovery, you can invite people. They're going to be welcomed like they've never been welcomed before. You know the most common thing I hear from people who come to Discovery? They say, the moment I walked in, it was like a breath of fresh air. I was welcomed. I was received. I was loved. I promise you that's going to happen here at Discovery. You have a church. Brennan, I don't have anything to share. Yes, you do. And guess what? You know the best way, the best and easiest thing you can do? Before I tell you what that is, I almost missed something. I want to share with you Jesus, something about Jesus and just a, a real quick promise. You are the connecting link between God and others. I want to say that again. You're the connecting link between other people and God. Stay with me here for a moment. In the Gospels, 40 times Jesus met people, touched them, and were changed. These people were changed. 40 times in the Gospel. 34 times, either the people brought Jesus to the person that needed him, or they brought the person that needed Jesus to him. This is important. Check this out. Don't miss it. 85% of the time, when Jesus interacted with somebody and changed a life, it was because someone was the connecting link to that person in healing. Someone was the connecting link between that person in freedom, between brokenness and wholeness. You can be that for someone, and all you have to do is be an inviter. 
All you have to do is invite someone to church because here we preach the gospel and there hasn't been one Sunday that's gone by that someone hasn't given their life to the Lord. Come on, you can celebrate that today. What do I have? I don't have anything, Brennan. You have a church and you can invite somebody. You can invite somebody today. Studies show, this is promising because it's scary to invite someone to church. It really isn't, but we think it is. But studies show that anywhere from 71 to 82% of unchurched people say they are likely to attend church if they are personally invited. That means your odds are better than Vegas. Y'all quit playing the lottery. I loved my grandma, God rest her soul. She's not here anymore, but, you know, she was an alcoholic, and she loved to go to Vegas. And I go, Grandma, give me your money. Let me bury it in the backyard. I'll show you a good time for 24 hours. Come on now. (laughs) This is good. Your odds are good. I love John 4, 28 through 30. It said the woman left her water jar. Jesus had interacted with her. She had encountered God, and, and he totally changed her life. And she left everything she had, and she ran back to the village. And what was she doing? telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came. The people came because she told them. I was at Tahoe Joe's. It was me and my wife's anniversary. We didn't have the kids. And, and then we're like, what do we do with ourselves right now? You know. So we're eating. We walk in and and uh, the server was standing there by the hostess, and she was like, I'm so bored. Can you seat them in my section? And I was like, girl, you done messed up. We're going to mess you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and so we sit down, and we just start talking, and it was kind of slow. And so she's opening up, and she's sharing. And I said, hey, are you going to church? And she said, ah, I've been actually really wanting to get back into church. And I said, well, I know of a really great church you should come to, and it's called Discovery. I didn't tell her that I worked here, and so I kind of just like it. You know, it's just a little odd when I'm like, I work here. It's really great. And you're like, okay, I don't believe you anymore. But then it's funny when I see people, and they're like, wait, you, you were there. Just, just this, last, uh, this last Friday, I bumped into a guy because a couple months ago, I was at Starbucks, and I was wearing a Discovery church shirt. And he said, hey, you go to Discovery Church. I've been thinking about going there. I said, bro, it's an awesome church. You should come. And then, like a month later, I, literally this last Friday, I walked in to get my drink, and, and I've known him for like three years, just saying hi, he's my barista, we're tight like that, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and um, I, so we walk in, and he goes, dude, you're a celebrity, and I was like, no, I am not like, but in my head, I was like, pulled another one, you know? <laughs> and, and he was like, bro, I've been watching online, and I love it, and I'm going to come this Sunday for my first time. I didn't tell him I was speaking. Sorry, bud, wherever you are, I'm so sorry if you're here or, or not. Sorry, come next week. Pastor Jason's a lot better. But anyways, you have a church. Be an inviter. It's that easy. And then we actually have something today we want to give you to help you. It's an acts of kindness card. They're out at the Connection Center. You know, when I told her and I invited that, that, that server to church, y'all better believe I gave the best tip I've ever given. You know what I'm saying? And listen, don't tell someone about Jesus and then tip them $3 at Tahoe Joe's. If you can only tip $3, you can't afford to eat out, all right? Y'all go to Food Max. <laughs> like, don't even go to Taco Bell. So don't you be giving these cards out and being like, here's $5. God bless your soul. They're going to need more than a blessing. <laughs> no, these cards, they're so easy. You're at Starbucks. You're in the drive-thru. Pay for the person behind you. I don't care if they're, they're driving a, a freaking Yukon, all right, and they got eight kids. Just pay for it and, and say, listen, can you just give them this card and let them know God loves them? And then you just leave the card. Or maybe you go to a restaurant, and maybe, maybe you don't even say anything. Maybe, maybe you're afraid of saying something. Yeah, it'll get, you'll get easier, and you'll get better at it. But you, you leave an outrageous tip, and you set that down. And you never know, but I'm telling you, God will use that. God will use that because he created you to share. And he is desperate for people to come to him. He, he, he is searching. He left 99 to find one, and he wants to use you to do it. Be an inviter. <clears throat> The second thing you have today is you have a story. You've got a story, church. We, we, we say, I don't have anything to share. Yeah, you do. You have a story. You have a story of what God's done. Luke 8, 39, Jesus had just um, cast out demons out of this man, and this man, his, literally his life was changed. The Bible says that he was shackled and he was naked, and Jesus came to him and touched him and cast demons out of him. And this man, he said, Jesus Let me go everywhere you go. You changed my life. Can I go with you? And Jesus is like, no. 
You can't come with me. All right, you stink. No, I'm kidding. He didn't say that. He said, this is what you need to do. Go back. To, he probably did smell. Go back to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. Tell them the story. Tell them what God has done for you. You have a story. God's done something in your life. Some of you today, you've got a past that God wants you to share. Some of you today, you've got history, and God wants you to share it. And all you've got to do is say, listen, I was blind, and now I can see. Listen, I was lost. My marriage was on the brink of divorce. I surrendered to God, and I'm whole. Maybe that's your story. I don't know what your story is, but you have a story. And don't just share the good parts of your story. Share your failure. That's your testimony. We're so afraid of failure and sharing our failure. Don't be afraid. That's the greatest part of my story. That's where, that's where I saw God's power at work in my life, where he took every failure in my life, everything I was embarrassed of, everything that I, I regretted, and he turned it around for good. That's the power of your story. Some of you, you're saying, well, I don't have a crazy story, Brennan, so where I really I don't have a story other than I grew up at church and I go to church every week. Really, have you ever lost a loved one and experienced the peace of God that surpasses all understanding? Did you know that's your story? Did you ever lose a job or come upon financial difficulty and lean into God? Did you know that's your story? You don't have to have been a drug addict and, and the Lord knows what to have a story. You have a story to share. You've got a story. <clears throat> it's so compelling when we see real change in someone. <clears throat> I love this next one. The third thing that you have to share. You have this to share with someone, and that is love. You have love. And how do we demonstrate our love for people? How do, we, how do we demonstrate and show people that we love them? We value others. You start by valuing people. Matthew 22, 36 through 40, you know this. Jesus says to um, the people, he, he, they, they asked him, they said, what's the greatest commandment? And he replied to them, he said, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And then he goes on to say, and this is the first and greatest command, but the second one, it's actually just as important now that I think about it. You're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and you know what? Everything you believe, all the law and the prophets, it demands, you know, that, that it hinges on those things, that we love people. If you love God, you will value people. When you value people, they will trust you. When you value people, they will look to you. Our culture today is so divisive. What side are you on? Who did you vote for? Did you get vaccinated or not? Some of y'all are like, yep, I know, right? Like, think about it, racial division, political division, moral and ethical division. We're living in a, in a tumultuous time with incredible division, and we buy into the notion that the most important thing to do is pick a side. And I love this verse, John 3, 16. Some of you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And when I read that, I think this. If God so loved the world, who gave us permission to hate it? Who, give, who gave me permission to be like, well, I don't love the world. They're not like me. Listen, we need to love. Too often we want people to believe in what we believe in, act like me, be like me, but Jesus isn't asking anyone to be like you. He's asking you to be more like him. And if you love God, you will value people. How do we demonstrate our love? We serve others. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he said that he became a slave to all people to bring them to Christ, that he entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. What does a slave have? Nothing. Paul said, I gave up my rights so that I could reach more people for the gospel. I served how do we do it? We serve others. He served to make a difference. Serving does something in your heart. When you serve somebody, it's incredible. God actually blesses you. And you know what? There's some actual application. This Saturday is serve day. And if you're here today and you want a renewed passion for serving others and you want to try this out, you can go online and you can sign up for a serve group. We've got a ton of different groups that are going to be serving in this community it's free. All you have to do is show up and lose your rights and serve someone. So if you're down to do it and get crazy and be salt and light, man, come on out to serve day. We'd love to see you there. The next thing that we need to do if we're going to really love well is get to know other people. We need to get to know others. We need to be interested in other people. 
We live in a time in society where everyone's self-absorbed and, and we all like to talk about ourselves. How about listen a little bit instead of talk? I love this quote from Zig Ziglar. He said, if you go looking for a friend, you're going to find their scarce. But if you go out to be a friend, you're going to find them everywhere. How many of you know that's true? All we got to do is love people, value them, get to know them, serve them, and then you're going to find people want to be around you. It's a funny thought, right? <laughs> when you quit talking about yourself and you show interest in other people, start adding value to people. Because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And you start adding value to somebody, and then they start listening to you. The fourth thing that you have today that's going to empower you to share is you have peace and you have power. And I know those are big words, and you're like, I don't know that I have that, Pastor Brennan. Well, let me show you what the Word of God says about that. John 14, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I don't give it to you as the world gives it, which is, oh, here you go, but give it back to me in 24 hours. I give a peace that's greater than that. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid because I've given you peace. You have peace to share. You're gonna find yourself interacting with somebody and they're gonna be moved and they're gonna ultimately see Jesus in you because the peace you have in the middle of your storm, in the middle of your trial, they're gonna say, there's something different about you. I think I want that. You can give that to them. You can show them that. All you gotta do is show them Jesus. Tell them your story. The next thing you have, you've been given power. You have access to God's power. When you pray, God hears you. The God who split the sea, who rained manna from heaven, he heals disease, he forgives sin, he lives in you, and you can share God's power. Acts 1, 8 says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. God wants to give you power. Why? So that you can tell everyone about him. He uses that power to spread the gospel. He uses it so that you could be salt and you could be light. And this power, it's meant to be shared. And the last thing, as the keyboard comes up, the last thing that, that you have today to share is so important. You have forgiveness. You have forgiveness. You have forgiveness. Forgiveness is powerful, you know, like, like not like the world gives, which is saying, well, I forgive you, and then, and then stabbing you in the back 48 hours later, holding it over your head for seven years, no, you've been forgiven. True forgiveness is life-changing and is what Jesus provided for you and me. And we can forgive because we've been forgiven. I love this. In Matthew 18, you know, Peter, he, he, he goes, Jesus, but like, really? How many times am I supposed to forgive somebody? Because, listen, y'all, it's hard to just forgive somebody once. Have you ever tried? It's not easy, especially when they've really wronged you and they're actually really worthy of your forgiveness. He said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And he's like, well, seven? Is that enough? And Jesus goes, no. I tell you, not seven, but 77. And what, what Jesus is saying is there's no limit to my forgiveness for you. And so there's no limit for your forgiveness to other people. Aren't you thankful for that today? That God doesn't limit his forgiveness and go, I already forgave you for that. So don't come asking me again. No, there's no limit to God's forgiveness. Forgiveness is your choice. You have the power to choose to forgive someone. Choosing to forgive is so close to the heart of, of God because he forgives you and I daily. And so what do you have to share? Forgiveness. Maybe someone wronged you and they know it. You pick your phone up and you forgive them. I promise you they're gonna wonder why. And then ultimately they're gonna see Jesus in you. Somebody maybe hurt you. You forgive them, it's gonna send a message. But we can forgive because we have been forgiven. But you can't give or share something you don't think you have. I almost had this point be forgive yourself because I think a lot of us, we, 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 we know God has forgiven us, but we've not forgiven ourselves. We can't, we can't forgive others because 
we can't forgive ourselves for something we did 10 years ago. Maybe you're ashamed of your past and you just can't, you can't forgive yourself. Maybe, maybe you sinned. Maybe you made a huge mistake. Maybe, maybe you had an abortion and, and it just haunts you and, and you can't forgive yourself. And then you wonder why it's hard to forgive others around you, but you're walking around with this weight that God never intended for you to carry. And I'm here to tell you, you are forgiven. I'm here to remind you that you actually have forgiveness to give to someone. I've made horrible mistakes in my life. And I can tell you that God has redeemed even the worst parts of my life. And if he can do it for me, I'm telling you he can do it for you. I'm standing here today and I'm telling you about the power of Jesus and his forgiveness because he's done it in me and he did it in me first. And if he can do it in me, he can do it in you. And if he's done it in you, he could do it in that person you know. He could do it in that friend you know. I love 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. He says, three times, this is Paul, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, God spoke to me when I couldn't forgive myself, when I couldn't get past this, I couldn't, I couldn't let God take it. This is what God said. Paul, he's saying church, he's saying abortion, he's saying alcohol, addiction, pornography. He's saying destruction in your marriage. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power, what I have to give, it's made perfect in weakness, not in wholeness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, there I am strong. I am a failure, but I'm forgiven. I'm under the same grace as anyone else. A lot of us, we're continuing to see ourselves in the light of our failure and not in light of God's grace, but be reminded today, God's power is perfected in your weakness. But you have to stop pleading and you need to start boasting in it. Stop pleading over your sin and start boasting in the power of God. Quit being afraid of your story. Yes, I was a failure. But I'm not pleading anymore. I'm boasting because look at what God has done in me. Look what God has done through me. And you know what? He can do it in you. I don't have it all together. People say, awesome, you never will. And neither will anyone else. Your brokenness, your incompleteness is evidence of God's grace, not a reminder of your failure. Receive that today. Be reminded of God's grace. Quit trying to hide your failure, your faults. Just live in the grace. And remember that you already have it. You already have forgiveness and you can share it. But it all starts by allowing God's forgiveness to take hold in our life. I wanna pray with you today. Can I pray for you? Come on, all across this room, let's, let's pray together with everyone's head down and everyone's eyes closed. Lord, right now I pray for our church. Lord, I pray for your people. I pray that God, you would teach us to be active in sharing our faith, that we would know that you've equipped us with amazing community we call the church. God, that you've equipped us with love. God, thank you for giving us all a story to share. Thank you, God, for even using our broken, messed up stories to show your power and your faithfulness. Thank you, God, for giving us peace to navigate life through the highs and even the lows, Lord. In every season, God, nothing is wasted. God, I just pray right now that we would have a new hunger and passion to share all that you have done in our life. And God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear the right time to share with somebody. God, I thank you that even before this day ends, you're gonna open up a door for us to share the hope that we have with someone who needs it. That you'll give us an opportunity to love someone and encourage someone. God, help us to understand every good thing we have in you. And as you keep praying today all across this room, there are some of you right now, you, you hear about what's possible with Christ and you know that you don't have that. The reality is you can be a, a church person and not have that. And that's my story. I, I went to church and I didn't have an understanding of God. I didn't know God personally. And, and there are those of you who, who say, I'm not religious. I'm not a church person. And even if I was you know, a church person, I would need to clean myself up first. But that's the wrong order. You don't clean yourself up and then come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and then he cleans you up. 
There are some of you right now, you might say, I, I don't have a spiritual story, but guess what? You're here today because your story is about to start. That's why you're here. And your story will go something like this. I was hurting. I was lost. I went to church. I prayed and boom, everything changed. I was dying under the weight of my sin. I, I never really thought I could be forgiven. And I prayed for forgiveness and I believed. And I know in my heart that Jesus forgave me. Boom, that's your story. Maybe your story is I was addicted. My marriage was on the rocks, but I turned my life over to Jesus, and now I'm a new creation. That's your story, and it's your story is about to begin. Why? Because you recognize your sinfulness, your need for a Savior. If that's you today, if you need his forgiveness today by faith, you'd say, I need to give my life to him. If that's your prayer right now, would you lift your hand up so I could pray for you? You're saying today, I want my story to start today. I want to give my life. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm ready for a new story, a new beginning. I'm ready to surrender. Would you lift your hand? Yes. Yes, God. God sees you. Your story's beginning today. Your story's beginning today. Say, Jesus, I surrender. I need your grace. Come on, let's pray together. If you raise your hand today, you can pray. Heavenly Father, Forgive my sins. Make me new. I believe Jesus died for me so I could live for you. Today I trust you with my whole life. Fill me with your spirit so I can know you, serve you, and follow you. My life is not my own. I give it to you. Thank you for new life. And all across this room, come on, let's thank God for those who said yes to Jesus today. Amen. Amen.